Well, so anyway, while we're getting it up, I'll just um, say that I think the reason why I was interested in doing this, Stacy actually, uh, she works for the Cancer Society, and I'm um, a grateful recipient of support from the Cancer Society, both in creating my position and a lot of the day-to-day -day work that I'm involved with. And so we do talk from time to time, and I think she came to me before I'd even really met her. I think she called me one time and she said, I have a question, you know, what are the rates of can such and such a cancer? I don't remember which one the cancer it was, in gay men. And I'm like, mm, I don't know, because I'm not an expert in this area. I've gained a lot more appreciation in the last couple of years, but I would not put myself forward as an expert at all in this area. But you know, there's not that many people that are. That's what I found out, because I tried to answer Stacy's question and found that the data just really were not there. And so that's what led me to be interested in this area and making a difference, because the more that I learned, the more it seemed that the gay community and the LGBTQ um, community in general seems to be bearing a disproportionate burden of cancer compared to the population at large. So, I mean, it may be true that it's a niche population in some ways, but I think when we look at the burden of cancer, that's not the case. Um, and so that's what made me interested in learning more about it and, and proposing some research to move forward on it. So I think I will... Um, whoops. I'm pushing the right thing. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So that's where this, I kind of preface it. So what are the rates? Okay, so you know the answer that I'm going to give you. We, <laughs> we, we, we don't know for sure. And why do we not know for sure? You, you think, okay, straightforward question. I, ex I fully expected that I could give Stacy a good answer. Um, but the problem is that we just don't have the pieces of the data that we need to answer the question. So there's different ways that cancer rates can be computed. And so if you're trying to understand on the basis of the population, you have to know something, uh, you, there's different ways you can do it. So you can collect data from people directly and say, okay, have you had cancer? Um, what's your sexual orientation? That would be an example of the, the presentations that we just saw in the, the large plenary where people self-reporting that information and uh, relating it together. Or we could just ask one of those things. Either we could ask somebody if you've had cancer or get that information one way and then get sexual orientation from another survey and link them together. And then we could come up with rates. And so um, if we wanted to get the, these rates, then we'd need to have verified cancer cases um, that are pathologically validated. Because, I'm, and I'm talking about to get really good firm you know, s rates that meet the quality standards that we use for cancer rates across the world. Because if you ask people, hey, have you had cancer? It's very surprising. People don't know what kind of cancer they had. Um, my, my grandfather, for example, for many years, my family said, oh, he had prostate cancer, but actually he had colon cancer. So, you know, people don't know, and it's interesting. So you really have to have the, the paperwork that shows what the tumor was if you're going to come up with rates. And you'd have to have something about age, because we have to correct all rates for age. They said cancer increases as you get older. So if you're just looking at, at numbers, that's not going to be good enough without knowing the, the age data. And you'd have to have sexual orientation data. And um, the problem is that cancer registries don't collect sexual orientation. They're our standard way that we get most of these data. And they just don't. Um, the, the BC Cancer Registry is a very high quality registry. It follows all the rules for cancer registries across North America, except it doesn't collect a lot of stuff. And um, so the stuff it does collect is really good, but it doesn't collect sexual orientation, doesn't uh, collect ethnicity, it doesn't collect a lot of things. It just isn't part of its mission the way it's defined it to date. And, um, and if we had a, a population-based assessment of sexual orientation that included that for everybody, that we could, like the census, you know, we could link it up, but we don't have that either. So it really means that we're stuck with having to make estimates not following what we would like to have in terms of very firm numbers. So some of the ways that um, we come up with rates are looking at self-reported. I told you it's not has its limits, but it is a way of asking people if they've had cancer, what their um, sexual orientation is, finding out, using that as a basis for rates. And you can look at subgroups of gay men at particular risk. And there is one I'll, I'll talk about that gives much better data because that subgroup is well characterized. And then sometimes you can make projections of what the cancer rates would be based on risk factors that we know are very well linked with cancer rates. So you know already, I'm gonna be telling, talking about smoking, for example, and lung cancer. So those are three of the ways that you can at least get a sense of what's going on. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about some of the studies that have been reported in these areas. And there aren't a lot. There, I mean, they're surprisingly, and to me, kind of shockingly, are not a lot. So um, one of, I think probably the, the sort of best and well-cited study 
looking at a survey that links self-reported data was um, reported by Bamer in 2011. And what that, her team did was to link information from the California Health Interview Survey, which is like our Canadian Community Health Survey, um, all the, you know, a, a randomized, a randomized uh, selection from the California population that included a sexual orientation question. You may or may not like that question, but at least it had something in there. <laughs> and um, a sort of rough estimate of cancer prevalence has a, a physician ever told you that you had cancer? Then they asked what kind of cancer. And um, one of the virtues was that the data are reflected on over 50,000 men, um, adults, up to age 65. Already it's an issue, right? Because cancer is higher with older people, so they aren't in there. But um, at least it was well done, well collected, well analyzed. And, um, and these are just showing a few of the data. Um, she compared heterosexual men, gay men, and bisexual men based on self-report, looked at cancer history, so that one's on, on the top, and um, found that gay men had a higher um, prevalence of um, cancer compared to the other two groups. Should that when they were diagnosed, and the gay men were diagnosed at an earlier age. And then she looked at some of the different kinds of cancer and um, prostate cancer, which Mary pointed out is an important cancer for men. It's in men in general, it's the most commonly diagnosed cancer. And in this case, the gay men had a lower rate of prostate cancer. Colon cancer didn't differ among the groups. Melanoma, certainly higher in gay men. Melanoma is a fairly rare cancer, so I don't know what the numbers are, but it wasn't a significant finding, probably partly because of the numbers. Other cancers, um, we don't know what they are, but um, gay and bisexual men had higher numbers of those. And then I just thought, for, for your interest's sake, to, to look at um, a standard question that's often used in research, which asks people to rate your health as a whole. Would you describe your health as excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? It's a standard um, question in many health surveys and is well correlated with actually physical exam findings. And so um, it's I thought it was pretty impressive that across the board there were no statistically significant differences across groups and people in general reported their health was, this is combining the excellent, very good and good, so pretty good. So most people saw themselves as in pretty good health. So, um, you know, the, the conclusions from this study, overall gay men had more can cancer they reported, younger age, less prostate cancer. We don't have information on a lot of cancers we'd like to know about, particularly lung. I mean, that's one that's the biggest, and that one was not included in this study. Part of the reason is because, unfortunately, lung cancer is uh, generally diagnosed at a late stage, and we have very poor treatments for lung cancer. So there are few lung cancer survivors sitting around waiting to answer the California Health Interview Study. So they aren't reflected in the population, and so, unfortunately, they can't be counted here. And um, and, and then there also is some cancers, including lung and, and anal cancer, weren't included uh, in the study, and they might be higher in gay men. We have some suggestions in other literature, and unfortunately, we couldn't take a look at that here. So that's one example, though. As it is probably the most widely quoted study of um, cancer rates in gay men, and it also looks, looked at lesbian and um, and transsexual, I believe, um, populations. But anyway, it, it's one of the few, and, and, and we know it has limitations, but it's kind of the only one out there. So subgroups of men, we can get much better data if we have a well-characterized sample. So the subgroup that's looked at the most often is people infected with HIV. And there are some very good studies, mostly US-based, that have looked at HIV populations. And um, the reason is that HIV diagnosis is a reportable infectious diagnosis, it has to go to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S., and so it's a reportable disease that's followed quite well. So in the U.S., there's very large populations, as you can see on the bottom, about 55,000 people who've been studied thoroughly for cancers and all sorts of other health um, outcomes. And um, as, you know, HIV, okay, it's you know, more frequent uh, according to sexual orientation. It's not a proxy for sexual orientation. It's not the same thing, so that's a limitation. And the data I've seen have not separated out um, different categories of individuals with HIV within this population. So again, that's not answering the gay men question, but at least we do have some good data. We know that HIV treatment um, has implications for certain cancers and, uh, and the diagnosis itself has um, 
age defining uh, AIDS defining cancers so Kaposi's non Hodgkin's cervical all virally related that are when they occur in um, people that don't have other risk factors it's seen as really an indication of, um, of AIDS but um, Shields and uh, et al followed this large group of um, HIV patients for other cancers, so not just the ones that we know are linked to um, AIDS, but looking at other non-AIDS defining cancers and um, quite a large period of time to draw on. So what she and the group found was that um, over time, so I remember it was from 1991 to 2005, and as you know, many advances in um, antiretrovirals and so forth happened over that time. So you would expect as the virus was controlled, you would see a difference in the AIDS-related cancers, and they did. So um, they found that the AIDS-defining cancers decreased over that time. The non-AIDS-defining cancers increased about the same amount. So people still were getting cancers, but not the same ones. So compared to the general population, the HIV population, higher lung, anal, liver, Hodgkin's, and lower rates for prostate and colon. So this, again, lower rates for prostate. So I'm uh, at the end, I, my, I, I'll, I'll give you the, the heads up already. I found that very intriguing because I don't know, and maybe I don't know if, you know, physicians can help me see why would gay men have lower prostate cancer risk? I'm not sure. So I thought it was interesting, though, when you see something consistently coming forward, that's, uh, it's intriguing. So I, I don't know, but it was uh, interesting to see. So, um, so generally, the, inter the increases in the non-AIDS defining cancers, so um, the lung, et cetera, um, uh, these authors, conclude that they're largely driven by growth and aging of the, the population with AIDS. And that was the biggest reason, not that the rates are somehow growing like crazy. People are getting older, they're surviving, and that's what's, what's happening. Now, the interesting thing, and I think this goes to Warren's question before, is that these non-AIDS-defining cancers are associated in, in all cases with infections, but different infectious agents. So um, anal cancer is associated with HPV infection, and both Michelle and Tinas are going to tell you something about that. Um, liver cancer, as you know, is associated with hepatitis infection. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma has been associated with um, Epstein-Barr. And smoking, not. Sm smoking is not virally mediated, as far as I know, but it certainly is um, lung, and lung cancer and smoking are related. But it's probably the um, HIV immune um, impact that makes people more susceptible to other viral infections that have lead to some of these cancers. So um, what the, they conclude is that this growing burden requires targeted cancer prevention and treatment strategies, which I think is music to our ears because that's some of the work that we, that we would like to be able to do in the future. So, um, okay, so the, uh, and then these are these kind of projections that are based on the risk factors. So I'm just going to focus quickly because I imagine many of you are familiar with some of these risks, but there are modifiable factors that both increase and decrease cancer risk. So the ones that increase are in the top and then the ones that decrease are at the bottom. So I have a slide for each one. So tobacco use, I mean, it's in, tobacco use is associated with increases in all kinds of cancer. You probably think of lung first, but if you look at the other cancers that are related, it doesn't just stop with lung. Anywhere that I think the tobacco byproducts um, touch your body, you start to have increased mutation in the possibility of cancers. And it's not only if you smoke, it's being exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. And so um, you may think that's fine, I'm not smoking, but if you're exposed regularly to environmental tobacco smoke, it has been increasingly shown that that is a risk factor for a lot of cancers as well. What we know about the rates is that it's higher in gay men, and um, one of the studies, I believe this is Toronto-based, 33% um, gay men are smoking versus 21% in the general population, so about 50% higher. Other studies find the same thing. So just kind of the, the message, if, if you don't smoke, don't start. Quit, it's honestly the single best thing you can do for your health. And there's, you have to keep on trying to quit. It's not so easy, but don't give up. Um, most people have multiple tries until they stop. And avoid exposure to tobacco smoke if you personally, or even if you smoke or if you don't smoke. Um, stay away from smoke that is in the air. And I know from walking down Davy Street sometime that that's hard to do. I see the sidewalks are filled with smoke and um, it concerns me. <laughs> 
Um, infections. So this is, again, just a little bit more about the different um, infections that are associated with different cancers. So some of the ones I mentioned, the HPV, HIV, hepatitis are here. H. pylori is a bacterial infection that's related to stomach cancer. It's um, more common in the developing world, but it's not unknown um, here in the developed world. And what we know is that the rates of HPV, HIV, and, and hepatitis are all higher in gay men. So the assumption would be probably these cancers are higher as well. So what to do? There'll be more discussion of this a little bit later in this presentation, but get immunized. I mean, get, get immunized when you can, my gosh. Get the HPV, get the hepatitis. Um, get treated. You know, if you have an infection, there are treatments, and uh, make sure you f take that next step and protect yourself from, from, be from being exposed to transmission. And if you are infected, consider the effect on other behaviors. So if you have a hep hepatitis infection, alcohol plus hepatitis is a really, really bad recipe for, for liver problems. So if you know that's a risk for you, then um, stay away from alcohol or definitely cut down. Obesity, overweight, <clears throat> so excess weight, relatively recently emerging lung, um, cancer risk factor linked with a bunch of cancers. Well, one thing we do know is that this is one a plus, that gay men are less likely to be overweight and obese than non-gay men. So that just on a population basis, that's a good sign. But um, certainly our population is um, very obese. And so the fact that gay men are less likely to be obese doesn't necessarily mean it's all good. Um, but what to do? You know, keep up the good work. If you, your weight is um, a healthy weight and one that feels right for you, that's great. But do monitor yourself because it's very easy to gain weight, especially as you get older and your metabolism starts to slow down a little bit in some people, like me. <laughs> alcohol. So excess alcohol use it does increase a number of cancers. And um, we don't have wonderful, wonderful data to say percentages of people using alcohol, but some studies do suggest that gay men are more likely to drink regularly and, and to binge drink a lot of alcohol at once. So the general recommendations for alcohol use in the Canada regulations for men are no more than 15 drinks per week, no more than three drinks per day. You can't save it all up, you know, to be really good all week and then take 15 at once, not good. Um, so, but, but, you know, three drinks away, that's, that's not, um, doesn't seem like that's a terrible imposition. It doesn't mean you have to become a monk and, and only drink... Uh, bottled water. So, but that, those are the, the rules for suggestions for Canada. Um, UV exposure. So we know that UV exposure completely increases the risk for melanoma and other skin cancers. The other skin cancers are not as deadly. So melanoma is a deadly cancer. The others may not be, but they can be very, very disfiguring. I mean, uh, and eventually, if you're in the sun and you don't take protection, it will catch up with you. If you live long enough, you're, and then it gets to be pretty nasty. I know from uh, people in my family. So um, we do know that there is a higher incidence of melanoma. That's one study I showed you. Um, and another source of UV exposure is tanning beds. And um, they deliver a real punch for UV. And um, there's a study in teens that showed they're almost four times as likely to use tanning beds at a time when their skin is growing and developing and all their cells are in hyperphase. And um, it really is a worrying sign to think that gay teens are so likely to use tanning beds. So, I mean, what to do? Any tanning is a risk factor for cancer. And this idea that you have to get a base tan that's going to protect you against the sun or something, that's another one of our myths. <laughs> it's uh, really any sign of damage to your skin is, is not um, good. Stay away from um, those tanning beds. Nutrition. So a lot of, the relationship between nutrition and cancer is not as clear as we'd like. It's a very difficult area to study. Asking people what they eat, quantifying what they eat, understanding what's in um, prepared foods is very difficult. So it hasn't been, it's a very complicated area within cancer um, research. But what's come through pretty clearly, again, low fruits and vegetables increase your risk of a lot of cancers, and high red meat is, seems to be particularly important with colon cancer. That's the strongest meat relationship that, that we've seen. So when we've looked at um, the rates, about half of um, men are eating, only, only half of people are eating at least five servings, which is kind of the minimum level of what we should be eating per day. 
and uh, the rates in this one study did were broken down by sexual orientation and didn't didn't differ. So everyone was equally bad. <laughs> so um, yeah, what do you do? Your, your mom told you eat your fruits and vegetables. Listen to mom. You know, <laughs> it really is um, something that you can do to to make a positive impact on your life. Physical activity, okay, low physical activity does increase the risk of colon cancer. That's the most strong link that we have at the moment um, in men's cancers. It's also strong in you know, breast cancer. And um, what we found, and, and this is another study from that same author from California, it looks as though gay men are more likely to engage in muscle strengthening um, than heterosexual men throughout their life lifespan. They looked at physical activity in general and then different kinds. Um, and so that's a good thing. But um, when overall vigorous activity was looked at, fewer than half reported any vigorous activity during the previous week, which is just like the population as a whole, which indicates the whole population, <laughs> including but not limited to gay men, really should, should uh, get moving. So 150 minutes of moderate vigorous activity um, per week is what's recommended in the guidelines. So that would be about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. That's kind of what, what is what's recommended. And then sedentary behavior, as I said, just sitting too much, apart from moving around, um, just sitting too much is a, an independent risk factor. So that's something to consider. That's pretty easy. I mean, sitting, taking breaks. In fact, you know what? Stand up. Everybody's got to stand up right now. I'm going to practice what I preach. Um, so um, yeah. Okay, very good. So you've already done something good for yourself. <laughs> okay, so in summary, I mean, the, the rates for gay men are not definitively established, but we really do have ed evidence that um, suggests higher rates of some cancer. Some populations, such as the um, HIV population, are at particular risk. And a lot of the rates are related to preventable exposures. I mean, there are things you can do something about. Lots of things in life we can't. These are things we can. Um, gay men do have better indicators in some areas, so um, muscle strengthening and weight control. And so that it's not, you know, all a, a negative um, picture. So when we think about next steps, I, I mean, as it said, it's really hard to come to conclusions without having good measures of sexual orientation or sexual behavior. I mean, one could make a case that it is an orientation as much as it is behavior. But to have something that would be validated, acceptable, provide good data is we, we really do need if we're going to come to really good conclusions. And then I said, if I, I want to explore more about this lower prostate cancer, see if it's real. Um, it uh, was not the case in that study that you pointed to that was in the newspaper yesterday, but they didn't report it exactly that way. So um, I, I do know the PI of that project, so I mean, I'm going to talk to her about it. And um, we'd really like to develop better approaches to prevention and early detection. We really feel that the um, gay community has been left out of some of the messages. Um, they haven't been tailored to um, being really speak to the gay population, I don't think, in as effectively as they could. And we've seen that in the fact that we're not seeing the behavior changes that people probably want to make, but we just haven't been successful in communicating. So that's some of what I think with, with Stacy's help and the Cancer Society, some of the research that we're doing at the um, Cancer Prevention Center that we hope to change. I mean, we'd like to make a contribution because we really think there's a potential to um, you know, not to be dramatic about it, but just save lives. And, and that's really a, a privilege to be part of that effort.